A warm welcome here to UTS. My name's Attila. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research, and it's my pleasure to introduce Terry a little bit later on. Tonight is the fifth presentation in the 2010 UTS Speaks Lecture Series, and I'm particularly looking forward to a lot of very interesting discussion and debate on the topics that Terry will raise. Terry comes from one of the most impressive and impactful research centres that we have here at UTS, SENSOC, the study of choice. I'm, I'm relatively new at UTS, and the SENSOC, uh, the SENSOC study, the research study, was one of the most, as I said, impressive centres to really start to understand what drives people, what just drives consumer behaviour in a fundamental and a rigorous manner. Recently, they just published two studies. One an independent public inquiry into Sydney's transportation system, which showed, despite the fears of politicians, that the majority of residents are actually willing to pay the amounts it will take to overhaul the public transport system to make it work for them so they can actually use it. Later, they also demonstrated that the Australian public were willing to pay for one of the options on offer in the emissions trading scheme. Indeed, Using their techniques, they understood that the government should go ahead with the plan whether or not other countries did so. These are very valuable insights that allow policymakers to make decisions that affect our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. If I can ask, talk about Terry. Terry heads the social policy and economic evaluation stream in this centre. Terry's work has been incredibly influential internationally. His diverse research addresses the major public policy issues such as quality of life, nationally and internationally, what Sydney residents are willing to pay for public transport, what value Australians derive from surface and groundwater dependent ecosystems. Before moving to Australia, his work influenced the UK policy with respect to the guidelines on what social care related quality of life should be valued by the public. His work on choice modelling has been recognised by the top UK funding bodies and he collaborates with major British studies to value social and health related quality of life. So without further ado, I'd ask Terry. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks Attila and uh, thanks for Robert and UTS for giving me the chance to, to speak tonight. Um, just a, a little bit more background uh, first of all. I moved to Australia just over a year ago and it wasn't just for the weather. Um, I've been uh, coming here on and off for a few years. Uh, I started working with Jordan Louvier, the director of Sensoc, about six years ago. And he was very interested in using choice models to value quality of life. And um, he was always very encouraging, and I would always have three or four manic weeks every year over here trying to get as much work done as possible. And eventually he created um, this job for me, and I jumped at it, I mean, because uh, when I saw the diverse areas that Sensoc worked in, it was just a great way of expanding uh, my knowledge and experience across public policy. Um, indeed, one of the first projects I was involved with, which Attila has mentioned, was work for the Sydney Independent Transport Inquiry. And um, this was really very interesting to work on, and it was, we were really very flattered that the Herald chose to lead with the work that we had done, that Sensoc had done, uh, eliciting preferences amongst Sydney residents for potential improvements to the Sydney public transportation systems. This was the article that was on the front page in February this year. And what was really interesting and had the high impact was that we used choice models to find out how much people were willing to pay for potential improvements. Choice models essentially present people with hypothetical but realistic uh, options. They tend to be specifications of a good or service, so we presented alternative improvements to the public transport network and the road network, along with associated costs, things like paying additional taxes, property taxes, paying uh, additional fares, a potential congestion charge, drive into the CBD, and this allowed us to elicit how much people were willing to pay for these big improvements. And as we always find with choice models, people are different. Um, there's no one single view out there. But what was very encouraging was that almost two thirds of residents were willing to pay the amounts necessary to bring the Sydney transport system up to the standards in many other countries. 
There was a smaller minority of people who were willing to pay, but they wanted the roads to be improved. And the smallest group of people didn't want to pay for anything. Uh, they were quite happy to accept higher congestion uh, and all the problems that will be associated with a larger population that is inevitable in Sydney. Now, this is an example of uh, a choice model in public policy. Um, choice models are now increasingly being used in other areas, and quality of life is the area that I've been working in. I thought I'd give you another media example here for, to illustrate how things have been done uh, a lot of the time to date. This is uh, from my local rag, the Mossman Daily, and uh, claimed that North Shore residents um, are the happiest in Sydney. Uh, the, the results from the Cumberland Courier Community Pulse Survey, no less, revealed that uh, the happiness score out of 10 for our Mossman residents was 7.5. Um, yeah, and um, they talk about, oh yeah, well, I only need to go down to Balmoral Beach, look around to see all the smiling faces, said Mr. Palmer. Okay, maybe I'm just a silly pom, but um, isn't the beach where you go to have fun? I don't really see many people crying down there. Um, apart from a few locals who are pissed off with the traffic um, charges, etc., and parking charges, but pff, can never please Mosmanites. Um, but it's actually not quite as simple as that. This headline result conceals some uh, other disturbing facts. It showed that residents were workaholics, 32% more than anywhere else in Sydney, saying they worked more hours compared to last year. People concerned with the economy, economic-related issues troubled 68% of respondents. So. Um, it occurred to me, well, these happiness scores, I'm not really sure we're getting the full picture here. And indeed, economists who've begun quoting these really should know better. They, if they'd looked in other disciplines, they might have had a little bit more reticence about endorsing some of these measures. Indeed, it's, uh, it's well known that they provide problems in uh, certain contexts. Uh, I actually prefer the quote from uh, Henry Louis Mencken uh, from the early 20th century in America, who was uh, quite a popular commentator. He said, explanations exist. They've existed for all time. There is always a well-known solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, and wrong. I think that the happiness scores are an example of this. Um, Mencken made very uh, controversial statements. Uh, he was, I think he was deliberately controversial, um, but a lot of poli uh, politically incorrect statements were made by him, but he ha did have some nice quotes. Now, uh, there are reasons why we should be suspicious of happiness scales. Happiness scales are an example of what marketers call a rating scale. And it's well known in the marketing literature that people answer rating scales differently. Your seven out of 10 is not necessarily the same as my seven out of 10. There are various reasons and various phenomena that have been spotted in the literature, particularly in international comparisons. Uh, the phenomenon of lucky and unlucky numbers. Uh, the number four is considered unlucky by some Chinese people. Uh, other people just don't use the extremes, full stop. That's, everything's going on in the middle of the scale. You also get some respondents who indulge in yay saying. They, for, perhaps they're keen to please the interviewer if it's a, an interviewer administered survey or just to give the right answer. Um, but most worryingly, these figures don't tell us where people want to be, what they value. They only purport to tell us where they are. So what about the missing 2.5 of the Mossman residents? What are they losing out on? We don't know. Finally, uh, a problem with these scores is that they're typically calculated at the level of the population or just a level just slightly lower. This leads to problems of what we call an ecological fallacy, where we use inference at the level of the population to make conclusions at a lower level, say the individual level, and sometimes these are erroneous. And that's an ecological fallacy because a lot of these happiness scores simply cannot uh, give you robust differences at a high level of disaggregation. I want to know really what I and my peers value, not what the average person in Australia does. 
Now, in fact, uh, I've got data which I think shows that uh, people are using different parts of the scale. At Bristol City Council, uh, where I was, I was based in Bristol before I moved here, uh, they administer a quality of life survey every year in October. They're interested in a lot of issues, people's perceptions of uh, the locality, fear of crime, uh, aspects of their house, uh, and all sorts of other issues that may influence city council policy. And as well as a number of individual questions about individual circumstances, people are asked about their quality of life. And they uh, administered a quality of life questionnaire that my team was involved with developing, along with a happiness question. Now, we looked at the data. And uh, the first thing I did was rescale the, the happiness scores, which were out of 10, to be on a percentage scale, to be comparable with the quality of life scores we got from our measure. Now, I'll describe how we got our numbers later, but uh, what's interesting is looking at the happiness scores, when you look at the averages in five-year age bands, the red dots here are the average happiness scores with the age along the bottom. The unhappiest people appear to be teenagers. I'm not sure I needed a survey to learn that. Um, people in their 20s seem to do reasonably well. Um, there's this big trough in middle age, uh, and that's when life seems to be pretty crap. Um, it, it then rises quite steeply, really. There's a suspicious little peak here at age 65. I don't know why that happened. <laughs> it, fall, it falls down then a bit and then starts rising again into advanced old age. Now, all well and good. I looked at respondents' other answers, and a lot of these people up here are very, very sick. Some of them are housebound, very lonely, and um, they're saying nine out of 10. Something just doesn't, doesn't seem right here. And uh, looking at our quality of life instrument results, we ask about five key dimensions of quality of life. And uh, we use methods, which I'm going to come on to, to give us a percentage score, summarizing their life based on their tick box answers, how much independence they feel they have, uh, how good the relationships they have are. And we saw some comparability for the early part of the age spectrum. The trough is here, uh, but it happens a little bit later in quality of life. And the rise, again, is nothing like as steep as it appears to be in the happiness scores. And these are data from the same people. We've got the peak at age 65, but then quality of life falls gradually and then steeply into old age. And that's far more consistent with the specific questions we asked people about their health and living circumstances. So there's a very different picture here between happiness and quality of life. What's going on? Uh, for Monty Python fans, uh, here's the Black Knight from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, getting his limbs chopped off and saying, it's just a flesh wound. I think the older people in Bristol uh, are putting a brave face on. Um, I think there's an element of blitz spirit. The very old will have lived through the Second World War. Bristol was bombed flat by the Germans, being one of the two major ports where all the Lend-Lease stuff came in from the US. And I think their attitude is that, well, if the Jerry's can't get me, nothing else will. Um, so I think they've essentially changed their frame of reference. That, uh, that, that, so their answers are just not comparable with those of younger people. And indeed, as I say, from the marketing literature, there are plenty of examples of people using different parts of a rating scale.